you so much for having me. I, I am uh, currently on a uh, seven-day, five-state book tour. You notice that, that means we're moving fast. And Atlanta is the last state before I go back home, work at home for a week, and then go back out. And it just is amazing that I would culminate here, you know, such a spiritual place such a, a place of soulfulness and meaningful. It's one of those places that as soon as I land, I start remembering everything that made it sacred the last time that I was here. So thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. And seeing old faith, old friends, and, and, and again, and just kind of taking measure of, of life and how it's moved forward and how it, it, it's evolving. I'm grateful. Thank you for having me. Thank you for allowing me to contribute to the conversation. It's a necessary conversation. Um, you know, we talk about abundance, and most people think that abundance is singularly focused. It's around just financial prosperity. And I wrote the book Abundance Now um, because, you know, after The Secret, I wrote No Matter What, and No Matter What was about building your bounce back muscles and turning your crawl into your walk. And how do you turn a crawl into a walk, right? How do you get back up and bounce back? Uh, and in, in the last um, six or seven years, I've been interviewed so many times. I was interviewed a, a 155 times in a five-month period. And a lot of people want to know, how did you go from being on government assistance to running a multi-million dollar company? How does that happen? And I kept trying to answer in sound bites because I was being interviewed. And I realized it's not a sound bite conversation and that it requires being unpacked and opened up. and and a journey. It wasn't just all about technique. It was about spiritual awareness. It was about being willing to get back up one more time when I got knocked down. It was about being willing to walk alone at times and be the only person to hold my vision because no one else got my vision. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. And so, so I realized that I wasn't doing anyone any justice trying to have the conversation fast and trying to squeeze it in, in, in a networking session or squeeze it in an interview that I can give you the highlights, but if you really wanted to know, we needed to have a, a deeper dive. And so I wrote um, the book Abundance Now, and I didn't expect to write the book. I was complete after Chicken Soup for the African American Soul, right? And then I did Chicken Soup for the African American Woman's Soul, and then I was in the secret, and then I did no matter what. I was kind of complete. Okay, I did that, checked that off my list. Writing a book is like having a job, and I'm cool. I'm done. But then it just became very clear that my life, the requirement on my life was asking me to leave some, um, leave breadcrumbs. You know, how, how, how. Um, I'm that same woman that in 1994 I was on public assistance. And by many people's standards, I'm not supposed to be where I am today. No one's, no one's thinking bad for me, but it's just, it's not the trajectory we think we're going to have. Mm -hmm. And so when I look back and I go, how did I go from public assistance to two years ago I took my company public? I'm the only um, woman in the self, the only company in the self development industry to have my company on Wall Street, and one of two African American women founders of a publicly held company, Kathy Hughes being the first. And I look at that and go, How did I do it? How did I do that? You know, we don't take notes while we're building our life. You know, we don't look back and keep score on what's happening. <laughs> we're just trying to, I was just trying to save my life and my baby's life. I didn't do it as, I want to be the first this. I, no, I want to be. No, I want my son to have a future that he wouldn't have if I don't do something drastic. And so I want to bring this conversation to you um, embodied in the conversation of what I had to learn to do first was love Lisa at a whole nother level. And that when I understood what love of self was like and understood that my contribution to the planet had as much to do with me serving as it had to do with me creating abundance and allowing them both to be okay, that as women, and particularly women of color, we become very, very comfortable with sacrificial service and the, a level of service to it hurts. And, and we're, we're, we're taught that not only is that okay, but that's gallant of us to do. It's gallant of us to serve until it hurts. You can see it when we have a social gathering at our house, we're the last to get dressed, where we feel our backs hurt because we've been cooking all day. There's this, like there's a badge of honor in suffering. And it's a generational conversation. And I believe that our ancestors did what they had to do so we could do something different. I just believe, I just believe that our ancestral history says, listen, because I did it that way and hurt, I, I did it so you wouldn't have to. 
And so um, I'm here to bring a conversation to you. Uh, a lot of it's out of my book, but I'm not going to speak to the book. I'm not going to tell you chapter five, verse 10. I'm just going to talk. May I do that? Yes. Uh, and on the book tour, people often say, are you going to read out of the book? No. I'm like, get the book. I'm going to talk to you. <laughs> like, why would I do that when I have you right here and you have me right here? Like, let's have a conversation. Um, there are three myths about abundance. One is that it's for those people over there that look like that, that live over there, that have that background. And here's what I know about the truth, that once you know the truth, you can never unlearn the truth. Yeah. Now you just have to choose to live like you know it, but you never get to unlearn it. That's why we say, I know better, because we know the truth, and then we know what we're doing. And so uh, abundance is not just for some people of a certain hue or a certain geographical origin or a certain background. Abundance is all of our birthright. Like because we were born, we have breath in our body. That your past does not in any way, shape, or form equal your future. Like it doesn't matter where we come from. It doesn't matter the story. It doesn't matter the experience. What matters is what do I choose to do with that? Is it fuel for me? Is it feeding my soul? Is it feeding my future? Or am I using it as my story to not play big in the world? And then the second myth is that abundance is singularly focused. It's just about money or it's just about possessions. That couldn't be further from the truth. Wealth is about possessions and money. Abundance is a 360 experience. Abundance is about the relationships you have in your life. That's abundance. Abundance is about your spiritual awareness, your ability to ground, to forgive, to let go, you know, to release. Abundance has everything to do with that. Abundance is also a physical thing. Abundance in your health, abundance in your body, abundance in your limbs. And then it also is about the money. And that it's okay to understand that money is a dignified conversation to have. That it doesn't question your spirituality to say, I want to be dutifully and rightfully compensated for the contribution that I bring to the planet. You like that, baby? <laughs> she said, now you talk in my kind of language. All right that we have such an unhealthy relationship to money because we make money uh, measure our spirituality or our level of servanthood. That when you're a servant leader, you should do very well. Let me say that again. Mm -hmm. When you're a servant leader, you should do very well because when good people do well, they simply do more good. It's very simple. There's no, no intense mathematical equation. When good people do well, you're just going to be more of who you were when you didn't have money. If you're doing good with no money, then we need to give you all the money you need so you can do good with money. Come on now. It's just it's a, it's a simple truth. But we have a tendency to measure our servanthood, our godliness, our, our level of give based on the money we make. And I know that personally, and I know both sides of it. Because in 1994, many of you may have heard this before, 1994, I was on government's assistance. Uh, we were just driving here, and we passed a WIC building. And I don't ever pass a WIC building without paying homage. Never, ever. As you might not know about that, but WIC is when you have a baby, and you can't feed that baby, and they give you free cheese, and free milk, and free pasta, and you get to make all, and juice, you make all the macaroni and cheese you possibly can because you got all the elements to make it. And every now and then you throw in a little broccoli if you can, if you can afford that. That's not on the program. And we just passed the WIC building on the way here. You know what? I, right. And I looked at it and I pointed it out to Carl. I said, Carl, look at the WIC building. I never, ever passed one without paying homage because I was that mother in line feeling too expensive, a little shame and a lot of gratitude. I was that same mother at the government's assistance line, waiting in line to get my EDT card. Grateful, grateful for the food stamps. A little ashamed, but more grateful. So when I look at my life today, that I'm the CEO of a multi-million dollar company, that I'm traveling the world, autographing things and inspiring people, that I'm spending weeks in Kazakhstan and Croatia and, and Germany and Slovenia, places where they don't speak any English, they're calling for me to come and get my message. You can't tell me that good people shouldn't do well. Yeah. 
You can't tell me that there isn't a blessing on its way just for you. You can't tell me that there isn't a bountiful life of abundance that doesn't have your name on it. You just can't tell me because I'm that same student that got no grade higher than a C plus in school. I'm that same student that got a fail in English the last time I took English. You can't tell me that there's not a special blessing for you when I'm on my seventh bestseller. I'm just going to claim bestseller now. Why wait, right? Why wait till the New York Times said, I'm going to tell them, my seventh bestseller. You can't tell me I'm the same student that the last time I took a speech class, I got a D minus. Your future cannot be determined by your circumstances, by someone else's perception of you. My grandmother says other people's perception of you ain't none of your business. Right? Right? And so you can't be defined by the things that you've gone through. Everything is fuel. Say everything. Everything. Everything is fuel. Everything is fuel. Now some of it is clear fuel and some of it smells like manure. But you can't grow some good seeds without having manure on it. Like when I wanted to lay my backyard down, my brother said, we got to cover the whole backyard in manure. I said, well, that stinks. He said, but good stuff grows for some things that stink sometimes. And so I just stopped by to ask you, what are you doing with your fuel? How are you using your fuel? Whether your fuel is a health opportunity, that's what I choose to call a health challenge. Whether your fuel is a financial opportunity, that that the divine is showing you how to be grateful for your pennies so you can attract your dollars, how to be mindful and responsible, that you can't attract abundance financially if you're not mining your pennies that you currently have in the right manner. Treat your existing money well and new money will come to you. Treat your existing relationships well and you'll attract the best, most high relationships. Now you have to know that when you elevate yourself, when it comes to dealing with people, not everyone's going to come to you. So if you are a woman and you happen to be single and you don't get asked out a lot, don't worry. It's because you're, you've put your bar at a place where they're self-selecting out. That ain't bad. That ain't bad. That ain't bad, right? That's all right. That's all right. Just call it that. Just treat it as a fuel that it is for who, the woman that you are and the woman that you're becoming. Treat it because it's the way you tell the story that has the impact on you. Your story is either going to be your fortress or your fuel. Your fortress to stand between you and the life you love or your fuel to, to accelerate you to that life. You choose how you tell the story. You choose how you allow it to feed your life. I just stopped by to stir your soul a bit. I stopped by to let you know that you're brilliant. Only brilliant people sit in this room and have this conversation. Everyone else wants the highlights from you. Just know that, baby. Let's be clear. And so you have to watch out for yourself because your 70% is somebody else's 159%. And you might make the mistake of thinking your 70% is all you want to get. And it's hard when you're brilliant because your 70% is impressive. Y'all get that, right? Y'all all silent now. Yes, you are exposed. You are exposed. And oftentimes, when you're this kind of woman in this kind of conversation, we've gone through life, we've gone through life measuring our light and how much we allow it to shine. Because we step in a space and we check ourselves and make sure the room can handle us. And then we recalibrate, you know, you got the dial, see, you got the dial, and you, di you change the dial to, make, to just, uh, just adjust to the room so the room can take you in. You've been exposed. You've been exposed. I challenge you, sis. I charge you, sis, to spend 2016 keeping the dial locked on high. Locked on high. You don't even know how to turn it down. You walk in a room and you no longer ask the room for permission to be you, to do you. You no longer ask the room, can they handle you? You walk in the room and you just do you and you give them an opportunity to adjust their dials to where you are. You give them an opportunity to adjust their dials and not in a braggadocious, not in the ego way, but in the way of opportunity. See, because one of the things I put in the book is that you need to be around people that make you tippy toe, not squat. <laughs> not dip, but tippy toe. And if you can be that blessing for someone else, be that blessing for someone else. I came to put you on your tippy toe. I came for that. That it's no longer time for you 
to measure a room and go, can they handle my light? See, it's not for you to dim your light so that others can, 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 can be validated in your presence or others can handle your light. It's not your job to dim your light down from 159 watts to 70 watts. It's your job to keep your light at 159 watts. And if the people around you can't handle your light, hand them some shade. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. It's that season. It's that season. I'm just saying. It's the season of no longer giving notice. It's because you don't get 2015 back. So anything you decide that you put off to tomorrow, now it's done. The time has passed. And so who are you? Who are you to play small? While I'm in your presence looking for you to play big so that I can get life through you. Who are you? Who are you to wait to the right time when I don't know if I'll see you again? And the moment I crossed your path was the right time for you to be a blessing on me. In the, in the moment that I was in the same hemisphere, atmosphere as you, was the right time for you to inspire me to be what I haven't been before, do what I haven't done before, so that I, I can be the woman I've always known myself to be. When was the right time? It was now. And, and, and we're always working for something in the future, and yet, you're missing a thousand nows. But this baby needs your now. I need your now. I am who I am because I watched a lot of people in the now. So it's not in your perfection that you're perfect for the job. It's in your imperfection that you're perfect for the job. It's in your willingness to forgive the perceivingly unforgivable. It's in your willingness to love the perceivingly unlovable. It's in your willingness to let him off the hook, her off the hook, your past off the hook, and soar into your breathtaking future. It's in your willingness to accept the brilliance that you always had, accept the beauty that you always had. It's in your knowing I woke up enough. I woke up enough. I'm whole and complete before I check any likes on Facebook. I don't thank you, but I don't need your likes. I woke up liking me. Thank, thank you for your generosity. And I woke up liking me. So yours is extra and bonus. It's are you willing? I just stopped by to disrupt you a bit. I stopped by to stir your soul a bit. I stop by to remind you of the woman you've always been, but we tend to forget inside of chaos and drama and survival. I stop by to ask you, can you abundantly give to yourself everything you need? Can you be enough? Can you? You've always been. Our ancestors have path, cut a path for us that says, I created you for my own grace. Can you own it? Can you own it? unapologetically can you own it? Can you not shrink so that others won't feel small in your presence? Can you? Can you love him exactly as he is? Can you not try to fix or change anyone around you? Can you be okay with their completeness as well, even standing next to you? Can you love your children to the individuals that they are, not to the ones that you think they should be? Can you? Most of all, can you love you? Can you love you like you never loved you before? Can you fall madly, madly in love with yourself? And what does that look like? Because love is a verb. What does love demonstration look like? I just stopped by not to impart on you a bunch of knowledge, but to just ask you some juicy questions. Some questions that stir your soul. Because I am the result of seeking a yes to all of those for myself. I'm the result of wanting my dash to dance. The time between my birthday and my transition day, I want it to dance. I want my dash to bring life into someone's space. I want my dash to create a stir in someone's soul. I want my dash to ignite a fire in someone whose path I cross. I want a dash to make the storekeeper feel wonderful and the man at the gas station feel good and the young woman who I crossed the path for a quick minute to feel inspired. I want my dash to mean something. I just stop by to ask you, what are you willing to make your dash do? I think your dash should dance. I think there's so many people that would be happy 
if you're dash dance. And I came by to remind you that you're not alone. That I know sometimes we feel alone and different. That I know that the people in this room, you are the unicorns. <laughs> and I know sometimes you twist that unicorn thing off and you put it in your purse. Because cause everybody can't handle unicorns, so you got to fake like you're a horse. <laughs> so I just, you covered up, put a hat on. I just came by to let you know that you're not alone. And that when we're together, put it back on. And every now and then walk out with it and let someone else see what a unicorn looks like. I love you. I appreciate you. Thank you.